Hello and good morning everyone and thank you for joining our Pure Storage webinar today. Um, so we're joined here by Max Brown, a UK Systems Engineer at Pure Storage, who will be presenting the webinar with you. Thank you, Amy, for that. Uh, let's just see. So hopefully uh, my screen should now be visible. So uh, thank you very much uh, to Amy and to our partner, Bytes. So I'll just give you um, a fairly kind of brief rundown on what uh, Pure Storage is all about, um, some sides of the technology and some of the business benefits that you could derive from this. So a quick bit of background, and I'll kind of assume that people haven't heard of Pure, some have. We tend to be getting a lot more traction uh, in the press these days. So we were founded back in 2009. We've been shipping product um, for about four years. We're on about our uh, fourth generation of product. <coughs> some of the investment that we've had has come from not only the typical uh, Silicon Valley venture capitalists, but also a lot of uh, large uh, investment uh, uh, pension fund type people such as Fidelity. We've raised close to half a billion dollars so far and uh, that actually kind of makes us one of the largest uh, infrastructure startups of all time. In terms of our global reach, so we are globally capable as it says. We're in over 29 countries now with a true global presence. Um, we have offices in all of these locations and we have about 1,100 employees which is pretty much doubled from where it was last year. And we uh, have about three or 400 partners globally that we deal through. So we are 100% channel focused. We only deal through the channel with partners such as Bytes. From a support perspective, uh, it's true 24-7 follow the sun support. And uh, the way our support works is it's very proactive in terms of, and I'll touch on this later, but the way the arrays actually phone home. So something like 80% of our support tickets are raised and closed by ourselves without the customer even being aware of it. If other issues do come up on arrays and customers contact us, we know exactly and instantly what state the array is in and what it's doing, rather than the usual rigmarole of download your logs and let me look at them. And then lastly, we thought, um, you know, it's one thing to be different from a technological perspective, but commercially we need to be very different. Some of the models around the total cost of ownership of storage have, to our mind, been fundamentally wrong. And they've basically been, to be honest, ripping the customer off. And again, I'll cover all these and how we're very different. So in terms of you know what the market think of us, um, you know we have the usual Gartner Magic Quadrant, and this one got released uh, June, so it's last month, and this is the second time they've released their All Flash Array uh, Magic Quadrant, and we are in the leader quadrant as we were last year as well. Usually, what you find is with companies the size of Pure Storage, or you know what I'd call a, a pre-IPO company or a startup or challenger brand, generally uh, they end up below that middle line, so they may have a good vision but their ability to execute is hampered. Now, what uh, Gartner have seen is that our ability to execute is you know, on a par with the likes of EMC and IBM, but our vision is you know, kind of way beyond those guys. So technically, what we're doing is you know, we've got a strong foundation for what we say we can do, and we can actually deliver on it. But I think the best proof point is not always what the analysts say. I think it's what our customers say. <clears throat> so if we look at the kind of customers we've got, there's a broad range, and I'll pick off some of the UK ones. So such as customers like Game, um, you know, these guys were running everything on traditional, fairly well-known spinning disk arrays, and they've migrated everything over to Pure. We look at companies such as Betfair, um, you know, they've reduced uh, their test and dev times where they'd have to spin up an entire copy of their production environment, which would take about six hours. They can now do that in 40 minutes. So they can do a lot of iterations more per day than they would have done in a week. And as a result of the success there, um, Pure is now the, uh, running on their Oracle backend database for their core gaming exchange. So literally, Pure supports Betfair's business. Um, we've got everybody as well, people like Ordnance Survey doing us for analysis of some of the um, some of the mapping systems. We've got Avis Budget Group, which uh, are using Pure for all of the virtual desktops. It's about 2,000, so every car rental location, it's a virtual desktop time back to Pure. People such as Investec Asset Management, they put in Pure, not only did they get a 70% reduction in space, which meant they were saving about £40,000 on their colo costs, they also were getting sub-millisecond latencies from their databases, which from a business perspective means they can now support four times as many portfolio managers. So that's an instant return to the bottom line in terms of uh, revenue generation. And all of these customers have a very similar story to tell from a not only IT transformation, but from a business transformation perspective. So how have we done this? There's kind of three main ways we've done this. So number one, technology innovation. There's no point 
uh, spending money, time and money, developing a product that's 10% different to what everybody else can do because there's just no point. Number two is the customer experience. So you know we try to we we do make this very easy for customers to acquire, very easy to deploy, very easy to manage, and also um, from an ongoing cost model, uh, the, you know the experience there kind of stacks up from our evergreen storage in terms of there are no sudden price hikes in maintenance. We don't force you into buying any new arrays just because the one that you've got has got old. Again, I'll touch on all of these, but these are the three key pillars of how we've been so successful. So just to summarize Pure in just four very short bullets, you've got the availability, simplicity, affordability, and performance. Now generally, if you know, these are the four things that I, if I was an IT manager, would want from anything, whether it's storage, network switches, servers, even software. But if you go to a vendor and say, I want these four things, they'll generally say, well, it's a trade-off. You can't have all four of them. You could have three at the expense of one or maybe even two of them. Now, when our founders sat down and said, right, we have a clean sheet of paper, let's look at everything that's wrong with storage and do it right, the first thing that we come up with was availability. Because to be honest, it's no good being simple, being low cost and being very fast if you find that when you have a hardware issue or if you're doing a firmware upgrade, the system runs really slowly and you have to do it out of hours or it could affect production. So for us, it wasn't just about having an array that would have you know, what we call zero downtime. It's an array that's truly non-disruptive. So having the full performance of the array, even when things are failing, having the full performance of the array, even if you're doing things like firmware upgrades or physically swapping hardware. <clears throat> so that for us was a number one goal, which we achieved on our first release. So simplicity. You know, I'll be honest here, every vendor says that their technology is simple to use. Some are right, some aren't so right. But for us, I think the thing that uh, kind of bears this out is we don't have any lengthy professional services attachment. We don't have you know, uh, great big installation costs associated with this. There is no tuning you can do. There's no tweaking. There's no designing you need to do from a storage perspective. You just have a box that's full of SSDs and flash, and then you just provision the storage to servers. You literally don't have to give it a second thought. And then if you tie into this, our proactive support, so that we know if things are going wrong possibly before you do, then again, that all adds to the simplicity that you don't have to wait for things to go wrong. We'll actually know and we'll be on your array, you know, obviously with your permission, and be fixing things before you even know about it. We also don't have any end user training courses. The closest we get is an eight minute video on YouTube and that's about it. From an affordability perspective, you know, no one said that SSDs and flash is cheap because it's not pound for pound, you know, spinning disk still generally tends to be a bit cheaper. But what we do, is we actually reduce the amount of physical hardware and capacity that we need to sell you. And again, I'll touch on these, uh, these methods later on. But in essence, we do inline deduplication and inline compression. Both of these combined mean that we get around between five and six to one data reduction on a global basis. So we don't actually need to sell you as much physical storage as you think you need. In addition, from a cost perspective, we have no software licensing. So all of the software is included. All of the features are included whether it's snapshots, replication, plugins for VMware, uh, thin provisioning, encryption, etc. It's all included at no cost. Any new features are free of charge as well. And we have a very flat support cost in terms of uh, the maintenance cycle, and we also do free hardware refreshes, which I'll touch on because I think this is as fundamentally different as is the technology. And then lastly, from a performance perspective, we are 100% flash. We're not a tiering model. We don't have any caching layers. It's 100% SSD. So regardless of the block size of the workload you want to run, whether you want to run a small block VDI or a large block database to us, we treat it all the same. So it's 100% performance all of the time. We've designed these arrays so that in reality, it's either running to the best of its ability or you've turned the entire thing on. There are no if, then, buts with Pure. You know, you can't make it run slower because something's happening. It's either running to the best or you've literally turned it all off. So if we look at the storage ownership, now some of you may be familiar with this, in terms of when you buy an array, you probably buy it, on the whole, most people buy it with three years support and you possibly get a decent deal. Then towards the end of year three, the costs for year four and five uh, they go through the roof. You know, this is what we call the maintenance extortion. So suddenly you're paying a huge amount of money to support some hardware that's three years old. And usually the way most of the big name vendors work is that it actually works out cheaper to buy a new storage array 
rather than paying to support the old one. So that brings with it a forklift lift upgrade. So you've got two choices, pay a huge amount of money to support something that's three years old or buy a brand new one to replace what you've got, even if the one that you've got is actually working fine. So you end up with a situation on the left where you're just constantly doing forklift upgrades. I mean, it's like you know the old guys that used to paint the fourth bridge. You get to the end and you start again every few years. So you could buy an array in year one, then in year four. It's too expensive to keep it, even though you'd be happy to keep it, but it's just too expensive from a maintenance perspective. So you put a new array on the floor. Now this brings with it a lot of expense because you're taking up a floor tile, you're taking up power, space cooling. If you're in a colo, this is costing you real money. And also there's the risk, you've got to do the sand design, you've got to do the zoning, you need more ports on your switches, you've got to do the data migration, which in itself is risky. And it's just a constant waste of money and people's time. So we decided, I mean, and we did this from day one to say this should not be the model going forward. The model that you should have is you buy an array from Pure and you should never ever have to buy another array to replace that one that you've bought, even if it gets old. So you buy the array on day one, you deploy it once, you add features, these don't cost anything because it's a free uh, firmware upgrade. You would then add capacity, which obviously you do have to pay for, and then at some point you may need to upgrade performance. This is where you can swap the controllers out for bigger and faster ones. But every time you're doing this, there's no data migration, there's no downtime. So you could have an array on day one, and then in year 10, 11, 12, all of the components could be completely different, but the array <coughs> itself has never gone down. It's never had to have any maintenance windows. You know, if you compare this to a VMware cluster, you know, a VMware cluster as a whole entity should never have to go down, even if you're replacing servers or replacing switches or doing any kind of hardware work. So a VMware cluster in 10 years' time, all of the hardware may have changed fundamentally, but the actual cluster itself has never gone down because you just move the VMs around. So this is how we do it. We call this forever flash. So there's three main things that we do. So number one is our maintenance cost. Our support costs never, ever go up. So what you pay in year one, two, three is the same in four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, et cetera. The, the only time our support costs would go up is if you purchase more capacity and it would only go up proportionately. We don't get to the end of year three and say, right, we want to put the costs up by you know 50% just because we want to make more money or because we want to sell you a new array. That is completely the opposite of what we want to do. We want you to stay with what you've got. So when you get to the end of year three and say experience with Pure was great, I'd like to renew my support for another three years, we then give you free hardware. We will upgrade your controllers free of charge. Now with an all flash array, it is the controllers that are the brains behind everything. So getting the controllers upgraded means you're on the latest, greatest generation with newer features, newer functionality, and it's cost you nothing. And there's also the fact that the controller upgrades and the way we do the swaps is done with zero performance loss. It's done online with no risk to your business. So this is, you know, if you look at it this way, this is almost like the, uh, you know, kind of a subscription model or like a mobile phone contract. You know, everybody knows that with their phone at the end of year two, your provider says you, you're due a free upgrade. So you'll probably get, a, you know, a phone that's two generations on. You stay on the same price plan, but you probably get more data with that price plan. So you actually get more for your money and brand new hardware. That's the same model that we're doing. At the end of year three, you'll have had constant firmware upgrades with new features that cost you nothing. You get a free controller upgrade, so you'll be three generations ahead because we pretty much release a new generation of controller every year because we're based on x86 architecture. And then lastly, the forever maintenance. We support everything forever. Um, I think you'll find that all other vendors out there in the storage uh, array market, they tend not to support the storage disks, whether it's spinning disks or whether it's SSDs, after five years. Because of the way their architecture works, the drives will burn out. Um, for us, we've said we don't believe we should do that. If you're paying us support, we support everything, even if the drives that you have are outside the manufacturer's warranty. So if you have an SSD that fails in year nine, we'll replace it free of charge. And we would be replacing it with a bigger SSD, and you'd get to use all of that capacity anyway. So if you've got a one terabyte SSD today, and in year nine it fails, and the biggest size is probably by then 20 terabytes, that's what we'd put in, and you'd get 19 terabytes of free capacity. So again, you know, the key components of the support costs never go up, we give you free hardware upgrades every three years, and we support everything forever, 
is a fundamentally different uh, commercial kind of argument compared to all of the other vendors out there in the market. So it is the fact that you know because of the modular architecture of our array, you can upgrade whatever you want, whether it's just the capacity, whether it's the performance, connectivity, adding software features. And all the while you're doing this, it's a very rapid, it's an online upgrade cycle. So all of these upgrades are continuously available. To do these upgrades will involve no downtime, no data migration, and no performance loss. And all of the software, as I mentioned, is included, so there's no cost to it. And from the maintenance perspective, as I just mentioned, you know, the maintenance cost is very predictable. So what I have generally find is that a lot of uh, financial people, uh, my customers, would ordinarily write things off over a five-year period. And mainly that's because of this constant IT hardware refresh cycle where it's cheaper to buy new kit than it is to keep old kit. Now, because our maintenance costs are flat and because we're giving you new hardware every three years, we've now had some customers that have moved to a six-year uh, depreciation or a 10-year depreciation because it just makes sense. Now, we've been doing this since day one. So when we started with the FA300 series through to the FA400 through to the new Flash Array M that we're just releasing in September, all of these hardware upgrades to move from one generation to another has been with no disruption. But also from a software perspective, each iteration of our purity operating environment has also been a non-disruptive upgrade. We've never required any data migration and no customer has been kind of left stranded because they're on old hardware and we've released something new. So this means that we can do very, very rapid innovation cycles. So pretty much every year new controllers come out and there'll be a major release of uh, firmware every year and a kind of slightly more minor release every six months. And also lots of kind of, you know, there's obviously bug fixes along that journey as well. So it's just this kind of better model that we're providing for customers in terms of the evergreen storage. If you buy an array from Pure, you'll never have to buy another one to replace that one because it's never going to get old. We're never going to twist your arm with cost to make you buy a new one. Obviously, we like you to buy extra ones, but you never have to replace the one you've bought. Forever Flash, in terms of the support model, it's very flat, it's very fair. You get uh, everything supported forever and you get free hardware. There's no cost to the software either, so all of our upgrades and all of the new features are free. And we do have a love your storage guarantee. So if you buy an array from Pure and it doesn't do what we said it would do within 30 or 60 days, um, we take it back. No questions asked and all your money's refunded. So let's just take a quick look into the technology and how we actually enable some of these things. So if you've ever dealt with storage, I think a lot of these things that I'm talking about on this slide will be very familiar to you. And these are all of the things that we have wiped clean from that slate. So RAID, you don't think about RAID. You don't have to set RAID. You don't have to manage RAID. You don't have to put drives in certain LUNs or drives in certain RAID sets. Yes, in the background, there is a kind of pseudo RAID protecting you against drive failure, but it's not something you have to worry about. You also don't have to worry about host and array block alignment. So if I've got a 64K SQL database um, on a 64K NTFS file system, but my storage array has an 8K block size, what does that mean in terms of performance? Obviously, there's a mismatch there. Or what if my array has an 8K block size, but, I only want to, but I'm doing a lot of 4K reads, you'll be getting 8K from the array. So it becomes wasteful. Then you get the traditional performance bottlenecks, or you know what I'd call the noisy neighbor, in terms of workload A is quite happy, here comes workload B, and workload B saturates the array, and it affects workload A. And it's, it's the worst kind of possible scenario, where you think, every time I want to put a new workload onto my spinning disk array, I have to plan exactly how many IOPS I've got left across all the drives, maybe what I need to redesign. So you've got lots of contention. You know, and if I just throw out some buzzwords out there. So, you know, people talk about meta lums, meta volumes, flex folds, aggregates, it's all these kinds of things are gone. It's not something you ever need to worry about again. There's no tuning, there's no tweaking, you literally can't change anything inside a pure array. The only thing you do as a storage admin is to basically say, these are the hosts that I want to present some storage to, and then you thin provision volumes to those arrays. There isn't anything, you know, the only decision you make is what name do I give this volume and how big should it be? That's it. In terms of RAID rebuilds, they're very fast. It's about 10 to 20 minutes. It has zero impact on performance. And uh, you know, it is almost a thing of the past. You know, seeing these day-long RAID rebuilds, because it happens so quickly, the risk of having dual drive loss is very, very rare. And our failure rate on drives is about something like 0.01% compared to 4% with spinning disks. So it's almost a, a non-issue. But we do protect you against that for obvious reasons. 
as I mentioned, there are no tiers of storage. We have just one tier, so you're not having to manage a caching layer or working out some kind of a tiering algorithm where hot blocks and cold blocks go up and down the stack. We have one tier, and it's extremely fast and sub-millisecond latency. And the cabling is massively reduced. There's hardly any cables at the back of these arrays. So this is what we sell today. It's called the FA400 series. And as you can see by this slide, we have, I guess, to be blunt, small, medium, and large. Um, each one of these models has two controllers. And the only difference between each one is the CPU, RAM, and connectivity. There is no uh, kind of software functional difference. They all run exactly the same purity operating environment. Because of the size of CPU and RAM, this dictates how much capacity they can support. So you can see the small one supports around 40 terabytes usable, and the large one is about a quarter of a petabyte usable. But the thing is here, it's basically we put all of our R&D cycles into writing some very intelligent software that we've put on basically standard x86 architecture. So these controllers are standard x86 servers. The drive shelves themselves are manufactured by a company called Xyrotex who do the same shelves for HP and IBM and NetApp and many others. So we've used off-the-shelf x86 hardware, but we've written our own software to turn this into a very powerful and very intelligent storage array. So if we look at what um, the flash market's been doing so far, it's kind of taken you know, two different approaches. So number one is the software innovation, which is what we've been doing. You know, kind of coming up with some very intelligent, very clever software that we've put on commodity hardware and made a very, uh, you know, kind of industry-leading storage array. Or you've gone the other route, which is the hardware innovation, where you've spun up your own chips, you've designed your own flash modules, you know, and from that you've got something very dense, very fast, but they tend to have not many features, and it's very difficult for them to, prog to progress. So we looked at things and said, well, actually, we've written the best software. Why don't we design some hardware to go with it? You know, if I look at, I guess, Apple's the best example of this. You know, iOS only runs on the iPhone, but because they go hand in glove, it's kind of one of the best solutions you can get. So we've continued to innovate our software, but we thought, well, let's design something from a hardware perspective that is going to fit perfectly with our software. So this is where we've now designed the Flash Array M, which we announced at the start of June. It goes into general availability in September. So it's much smaller, so it has a very small size. So you're looking at 120 terabytes in a 3U chassis, consuming less than a kilowatt of power. It can expand up to half a petabyte of usable, and it's all completely non-disruptive expansion. It goes up to 300,000 IOPS, um, and it's about 50% faster than our previous generation. Again, all at milli sub millisecond latency, and it is extremely simple to, to deploy in terms of its physical size and cabling. So this is what it looks like under the covers. So with the Flash Array 400 that we sell today, the controllers are physically separate units. Whereas with this one, if you look on the right-hand side of the diagram, so you can see the back of the array, you'll see that we have two physical controller modules that are slotted basically like blades. Around the front of the uh, chassis, you've got 10 uh, NVRAM modules, so you've got 10 uh, flash modules for the capacity, and you've also got four of these NVRAM modules. These NVRAM modules are the right cache. But because the write cache is not tied to a controller, we don't get stuck with any of the usual constraints of if a controller dies, I lose half my write cache, etc. We've decoupled that architecture. So we've basically come up with, uh, I guess, a blade type design um, for our new Flasher AM. Uh, the person that we got to design this was the same person that was responsible for the Brocade uh, Fabric Director. He was also responsible for Cisco UCS blades. We got him on board and said, look, we need to do a similar thing. So really what we've done is we've repackaged around an existing architecture. So we are still using um, to typical connectivity design. So internal SAS, NVM Express, PCIe. Uh, we haven't actually designed any specific chips. Set. So it's still standard uh, x86 architecture, but we've repackaged it into something that makes the protocols much faster to use and much easier and simpler to deploy. So if we look at the uh, Flasher AM, so our smallest unit is the M20, which scales to 120 terabytes in 3U, does up to 150,000 IOPS, but you'll note that we quote our IOPS performance speed at a 32K block size. If you compare our spec sheets to many other vendors, you'll find that many other vendors will state 4K or 8K block sizes for performance figures because it makes them look better, when in reality, People aren't doing 4K or 8K block sizes. You know, the average block size that we see from all the customers arrays dial in home is in the region of about 50K. And these are the customers that are doing everything from VDI 
to SQL to Oracle to VMware to Hyper-V. So we quote a more realistic performance metric. If you look at the M50, that goes up to a quarter of a petabyte, and then the M70 scales to 400 terabytes. And this is in 11 U of space. And moving from one model to another, again, is a very simple thing to do. So moving from one model, even if it's the FA300 in the early days, to the 400, to the M, every uh, upgrade that a customer's done from one generation to the next has been completely non-disruptive. Mm -hmm. And it's been done with zero downtime and zero performance loss. Also, what we do is we don't charge you for the new controllers. So let's say you purchased an M20, which does not support any external expansion cells. So if you buy an M20 and you fully populated it with drives and you hit the, obviously, its maximum capacity, your next uh, iteration of capacity would be to buy an external shelf. Now, in order to support that, you actually need to go to the M50 model, the mid-range, uh, the mid-level one. Now, most vendors would charge for those mid-range controllers because you've gone to the next model. We don't. That is not the way we work. So you'd buy your M20, fill it with drives, and then you'd buy a shelf, and we would give you the M50 controllers for free. And that upgrade to the M50 is non-disruptive with no performance loss. And this continues all the way through, even up to the M70 with four shelves. So at no point do we charge you for bigger controllers just because you're adding capacity. If you're adding capacity, and it means you need bigger controllers, we don't charge for them. And whatever we design for the next architecture of Pure, that will also be backwardly compatible, and that will also be a non-disruptive upgrade. So this in itself is fundamentally different to what everybody else is doing in the market. You couple this with our commercial offering in terms of we don't charge for bigger controllers when you upgrade. Uh, we give you new controllers anyway at the end of every three years and replace what you've got. And the fact that we support everything forever and the support costs are flat, you know, fundamentally makes for a very, very different business case. So how are we delivering this from a more technical perspective? So the controller modules are what I'd call stateless in terms of the controllers themselves don't hold any important information about the array. So all of the metadata, all of the configuration information is held across all of the drives in the shelves, not in the controllers. Each controller is capable of running at full performance. So if at any time you lose a controller, and the chances of losing a controller is very slim, but what you may be doing is swapping the controllers out for bigger ones because you've upgraded, or it's the end of three years and we're giving you new controllers, or more likely, you're doing a firmware upgrade which necessitates that each controller will have to do a reboot to load the new code. So at some point in time, your array will be running on one controller. That single controller can sustain 100% of the full load. So you won't get any performance hits or any issues when you're only running on one controller. And because the write cache lives external to the controllers, when a controller disappears via a reboot or you take it out to replace it, you haven't lost any write cache. Again, this is a fundamentally different architecture. From uh, you know, a, a software perspective and our purity operating environment, so we can mix and match drive types. Um, you, know, you could buy a shelf that contains one terabyte SSDs. You might buy another shelf that contains two terabytes, another one that contains four terabytes. To us, it doesn't matter. The reason I bring this up is a lot of architectures will lock you into your initial design. So if your first deployment is a shelf that's worth 10 terabytes of capacity, you can only add 10 terabyte shelves thereafter, even when they release larger ones. So you get stuck with a, you know, the wrong architecture on day one. We also have what I call a non-blocking I.O. architecture. So what we mean here is that reads and writes don't impact on each other. We have a very clever way of scheduling the I.O.s so that if a drive is being written to, it can't be read from at the same time. And we can also, you know, in order to do this, we would read the data from parity from the other drives. But pretty much this helps us almost avoid the noisy neighbor. So whether you're doing 1,000 VDR users and then you want to run some 64K SQL databases on the same array at the same time, you can do this. And there won't be any impact on performance. We have customers that will do their firmware upgrades at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because they know that there is no performance impact. We have customers that now kick their backup jobs off at lunchtime because they know that doing a backup will not affect the performance of the production array. So it's just giving you more flexibility and less things that you need to worry about. In this instance, you could almost say storage has become a utility. It's like a tap. When you turn it on, the water comes out, and you've got the pressure you need. You don't worry about what happens if another tap's turned on, what happens to my water supply further down the route. It's all fully managed internally. It's not something that you should need to ever worry about. 
So again, I won't go too deep on some of the technical aspects on this, but it is, it is, it is, sorry, it is a fact that our virtualization layer, we virtualize at a 512 byte chunk size. So this means this is how we avoid any alignment issues between various different block sizes coming in. It's also the size at which we do our deduplication. So we get very fine grained dedupe. We actually, I guess the key thing for Pure is we only understand SSD and flash. All of our code is written to understand the intricacies and the geometry of SSDs and how they should work. Just because you can put SSDs into a traditional storage array, it does not mean it's going to work that well. If an array has not been tuned to work with flash, it's going to basically cause a lot of uh, bad side effects. And you hear people talk about things like write amplification. This is where an SSD will get good data and then constantly have to rewrite it because that array does not understand how to treat it. If you align um, your storage code with things like the erase block boundary, and there's many other things I could go into, but I won't now, but in essence, it minimizes the work that the SSD is doing. So not only are we reducing the amount of work coming in because we dedupe and we compress, so there's much less IO work going on at the back end, because we understand the geometry of SSDs, we understand how they should be written to, we understand exactly how to treat them. We get better performance and better longevity and much more predictable performance. I mentioned the non-blocking reads and writes, so basically they're isolated, they don't interfere with each other. We do the garbage collection at, a, at an array level, our controllers actually take care of the garbage collection algorithms, they do them more holistically rather than letting each SSD do it. And we're also, we're always periodically refreshing these cells and doing optimizations in the background, as well as verifying the data integrity and checking the parity bits. So it is a very simple approach to storage. It is very appliance-like. It's one chassis. There's only a few cables. So you've got two power cables, two ethernet cables for management, and then maybe two, four, six, or eight uh, fiber channel or iSCSI cables, however many you see fit but there's no extra cables to connect to external shelves as we had previously. There's no data migration for the upgrades. There's no add-on controllers. You just swap things in situ, like a blade chassis. You just take things out and replace them. All the software is built in. It's all included, whether you're looking at HA, um, disaster recovery, replication, snapshots, management, SRM. There's no add-on appliances for management. You don't need a, a VM to manage us or a separate server. You just literally point to the IP addresses on the array and all the management's built in. And you don't have to worry about the storage. So if you need to do a firmware upgrade, if you need to replace components, you know that it is not going to impact performance at all. So you can do all of this stuff in the daytime, which is kind of almost counterintuitive, but the way we design Pure is that's the way it should be. It shouldn't be something that impacts on your business. If we just compare ourselves to you know, one of the other leading uh, Flash players in the market, so if we look at our Flash Array M, which is getting about 410 terabytes usable and getting around 300,000 IOPS, we compare that to one of our major competitors, and you know, they're getting 500 terabytes usable and they get about 375,000 IOPS, but when you look at the, uh, the diagram on the right, which is actually a full rack, it's a full 42U rack of storage, compared to us on the left, which would be 11U, so we're a quarter of the size. But as you can see, we've just got 22 cables compared to 150. The amount of power that we would be consuming would be something in the region of about a couple of thousand watts, um, whereas the, uh, the one on the right-hand side would probably be about eight or 9,000. So there's huge differences to be had because of our new very small and modular architecture. So in terms of the data reduction to make the array cost effective and to make it very performant as well. So as I mentioned earlier, our average data reduction is between five and six to one. Um, the way that we do this is it's not only the inline dedupe and compression, so it is important to note that these are inline. We don't land the data on all the SSDs full size and then run a sweeper job at night that then compresses it and dedupes it. We do it as the data comes in, which means we don't have to write as much to the SSD. So data comes in, we look at the block of data at a 512 byte level. If we've seen it before, we, uh, just do, uh, we just update the metadata and don't write it. Any blocks that come in that we've not seen before that are obviously new and unique, we would then compress them before we write them to the SSD. So this massively reduces the I.O. that we're doing. We also do pattern removal, we don't write zeros, um, and we do a deeper reduction. So we do an additional reduction once the data's on the SSDs, you know, when we get some background cycles. And then if you tie this into things like snapshots, clones, and X copy, you suddenly realize that you can take 
many more copies of your production or your test and dev databases than you would ordinarily without any impact on uh, production from a performance perspective and it also consumes much, much less space because obviously you take a snapshot and any changes that we track would only be the unique block changes because we're still doing deduplication and compression. So on that note, um, there are some vendors out there that do deduplication, there are some that do compression, there are very few that actually do both and those that do both don't do it as efficiently as us. So we've got about twice, we've got about two times better data reduction than our next nearest competitor in the market. And again, this is because our deduplication is down at 512 bytes. Compare this to somebody who's doing deduplication at 16K, which is so large, they hardly get any benefit at all. So the deduplication coupled with the compression means that we're good for all environments. If you look to the left-hand side of the scale with databases, where we generally see about three or four to one data reduction, you can see that it's compression that takes up the lion's share of the advantage there, because within a single database, you're not going to get much deduplication. Although, you know, Oracle with an 8K block size, you know, with the headers inside it, we can actually find some duplicates within each Oracle block. If you go to the right-hand side of the scale, where you're looking at virtual desktops and clones, then obviously deduplication plays a huge factor here because there are a lot of objects that are all identical. So the fact that we do deduplication and compression means that we're suitable for any type of workload rather than having an array that's great for doing databases or is great for doing VDI. We're great for both. And this is why customers will deploy a mixed workload on Pure. So they'll have the Oracle database sitting next to virtual desktops, sitting next to um, uh, virtual infrastructure as well. So inbuilt uh, within the array, we have snapshots and we have replication. So our snapshots are very, very space efficient. You can take up to 5,000 snapshots per array. They have no overhead in terms of performance because of the way we've designed our metadata structures, because of the fact we dedupe and compress, so we're actually tracking a lot less changes, and because of the way we do the I.O. scheduling. And it's also, as I said, space efficient because we don't store the same block over and over and over it is impossible for us to store more, the same block of data more than once. So even when you say clone a database, we literally just update pointers. We don't do anything until we start seeing some unique data block changes. If you couple this with our inbuilt replication, so our replication is asynchronous point in time scheduled. So you might be replicating every hour or every 15 minutes or every five minutes. It's up to you what you set this uh, the granularity at. And then the protection policies that we do are based around, you know, what is it you want to protect? Is it just one volume? Probably not. It's probably a handful of volumes. So you create what most vendors would call a consistency group. But we also do these consistency groups, <coughs> or protection groups as we call them. We don't only do them just by volume. We can do them by server or by our cluster of servers. So if you've got um, six ESX servers with six volumes, that's kind of 36, you know, objects to protect. Whereas what we can do is say, Treat that, treat that whole cluster as one object. So then if I add in a new volume number seven to that cluster, it automatically becomes part of my replication policy. I don't have to remember to add it in. You can recover at any point in time, so you can roll forwards, roll backwards, you can take a snapshot and mount it up to a server, you could do the same at DR, and from a replication perspective, it's multi-site, so we can do one-to-one, -one, one one-to-many, or many-to-one. So very kind of simple ways to do it. It's all inbuilt, very simple to use, and it's at no cost. From a management perspective, so you know, we talked about the kind of the three key pillars of Pure being the technology innovation, being the evergreen storage in terms of you know our support and cost model and the free hardware, and also the customer experience. So every array dials home every 30 seconds. Um, it, each array generates between 10 and 15 gigabytes of data per day. And because we've got about 2,000 arrays dialing home, we've got about five petabytes of machine data that we're constantly analyzing. So we don't just let it sit there. We actually run analysis where we can spot trends. So we might suddenly find that we're seeing a trend where a certain version of firmware is exhibiting uh, latency issues. We could write a fix for that. We could then identify all of the customers that could have that potential issue waiting to happen, and we can then upgrade for them. And the way that we do the upgrade is we contact the customer, you click a button in the GUI to open up a secure tunnel to our support organization. They then dial in. They will stage the code, do all the, pre do all the pre flight checks, check the hardware's good, check that your multi pathing is working correctly, and then they'll carry out the upgrade. And again, the upgrade happens with zero downtime and zero performance loss. So it's almost as if nothing's happening, and we're doing the fixes in the background. 
also with a continuous call home. So it may be that you phone us up with a question to say, my performance doesn't look right. Instead of us saying, please download the logs, send them to FTP server, we'll have a look at them and get back to you in three hours. The minute you start talking to us, we can instantly see what's happening. We can instantly see the logs. You say it happened at 10.30. We'll be looking straight at 10.30. We'll be able to see the latency and what's going on inside the array and outside the array. So it just adds to a much, much better experience for customers. And for a lot of customers that run proof of concept, it's the support experience that actually makes them decide that they want to stay with Pure. You know, when, we open a, when a customer opens a support case with us, we don't close it until the entire thing has been resolved. So if it is the usual, I've got a performance issue, and it turns out to be outside the array, not only are we happy to analyze your switch logs or analyze your VMware logs or your HBA logs, um, we can do that, but also we keep the case open until you've had it completely solved by all of the vendors. We don't just close it and say, it's not our problem. So whatever you're doing with, uh, with your environment, whether you're running your own private cloud, which, you know, as VMware coined the phrase, the IO blender, because suddenly you've got all these virtualized environments doing very different work, going through a few servers down to one lot of storage. There's a lot of different workloads going on. Well, with us, because of our variable block size, because of our IO scheduling and our non-blocking IO, you can just keep throwing workloads at Pure as much as you like. It's, uh, in terms of integration with VMware, we have plugins to the vSphere web client, so you can manage all of the array um, through the web client on uh, with vSphere, you know, you can create data stores through there and it will talk to Pure and use APIs in the background to actually carry out all of this work. We also have a fully functioning CLI and REST API. We've got a lot of PowerShell uh, integration, Python integration. So, and, you know, lastly, there is no need for storage experts because there is very little that you need to do to actually work with Pure. If you're looking at delivering VDI, then the thing that you need to do is you need to have each virtual desktop having the performance of a local SSD or maybe even better. And more key with VDI is being able to handle uh, the peak boot login storms, uh, the patch Tuesday, the virus scans, anything that causes a lot of sudden IO or a lot of people logging on or logging off, you need to be able to handle that. You know, with Pure, the tests we've done, you can boot something like 100 desktops in 20 seconds. And also you need an environment that can scale from hundreds to thousands of users in one array. And even if this means that the array is being upgraded to the next level to cope with these levels of performance or capacity, the fact that those upgrades are done with zero downtime and no performance loss means that your users will never know that this has actually been happening. And also it's very simple to administer. You can administer this all through the vSphere web client. And then lastly, if you're looking at databases, so I generally come across two types of DBA. There's the DBA who doesn't really care about the storage. He just phones up the storage admin and says, can I have some more space? Uh, but then I often find there's the DBA that is massively concerned about storage and will be dictating that he wants RAID 10 for his logs, RAID 5 for his DBF files. He might also be asking what's the block size of the array, what's the stripe size, what's the stripe depth, and all these different things. Well, with Pure, it doesn't matter. The block size is largely irrelevant to us because we've designed it to not have a fixed block size at the back end. So your DBA can design the database to fit the application, which is the way you should do it. You shouldn't design a database to fit your storage. You can decide if you're Oracle, shall I use ASM for raw devices or the native file system? Again, no difference to us. And what about the number of LUNs? So in some environments, you need to have lots of different LUNs to spread the I.O. across. For us, it doesn't matter. It's just one pool of storage with one pool of I.O. So whether you're using one LUN or 10 LUNs or 20 or five, it doesn't make any difference to us. So you can design your LUN layout the way that you want. You don't need to worry about RAID, as I mentioned earlier, there's no RAID calculation, you don't have to work out what's going to go on what RAID level, you just need to be, you know, rest assured that we protect you against dual drive failure in any shelf, and there's no performance impact if you were to lose any drives. No caching, no tiering, it's easy to grow the LUNs, you just click one button, the LUNs bigger, then you then expand your file system, and also because of the snapshots, because of the fact that snapshots don't impact performance, and also um, they take up much, much less space you could now have way more copies of your test and dev database than you would have had before, which for a lot of companies means <clears throat> that's faster time to market, faster development cycles, faster UAT. So just actually it's something that could increase revenue to your bottom line. And then lastly, database compression. Well, you might as well let us compress it at the storage layer. There's no point tearing up CPU cycles to do database compression. And if you look at systems like Oracle, they charge, they charge thousands of dollars per core for database compression. You might as well let us do it and there's no performance impact either. 
So just to kind of come back to the start in terms of you know what is pure storage. So it is all about the availability. It's not only zero downtime, but there's no performance loss. So it's truly a non-disruptive uh, storage environment. It's very simple. There's no professional services. There's no end user training course. There's no tuning you can do. There's nothing you need to design. You couple this with our proactive support in terms of us knowing exactly what your array is doing. It means it just makes life so much simpler and you let us do the upgrades for you. From an affordability perspective, so the deduplication, the compression, and all the other data reduction techniques means that you need less physical hardware, which means it costs less, it takes up less space, it takes up less power, less cooling. There's also no software licensing, so there's no associated cost to deploy new features. And then the flat support costs, which again is a real game changer in terms of what we're doing in the storage industry. In terms of support costs stay flat forever, they only go up if you buy more capacity. We refresh your hardware every three years, and we support everything forever, regardless of how old it is, regardless of how worn it is, you know, it doesn't matter to us. We will replace things if they fail. And the performance. So any workload, we don't have a fixed block architecture. So whatever you want to run on Pure is great, whether it's VDI, whether it's VMware, whether it's large block SQL. Again, it makes no difference to us. Just use us as a, you know, a flash consolidation platform. So just to finish off, um, you know, it is this better model for the evergreen storage, the forever flash. We don't charge for the software. And we're confident that if you, you know, if the array doesn't do what we said it will do, we take it back. So thank you for your time. And uh, are there any questions? Amy, do we have anybody that has any questions? OK, thanks, Max. Um, yep, so if you do have any questions at all, um, just pop those in the questions box, um, which is just at the right-hand side of your screen there. So just wait a couple of minutes, see if we if we get any one second. Okay. Okay, so we have a question here, um, and they've asked uh, about the cost, what the cost would be. Uh, right, so cost, um, to be honest, it depends on the size and what you need to do with it. So with traditional storage, it's quite easy to say, um, you know, five one terabyte drives in a RAID 5 gives you four terabytes usable, and it costs £4,000, therefore it's a £1,000 a terabyte. With Pure, it's very different. So one of our arrays that has about five terabytes of raw capacity could support anything from 10 terabytes to 60 terabytes usable. So cost, it varies depending on the size of model. Um, you know, entry level costs are probably end user price, something like 50, 60,000. But again, this could be supporting 1,000 virtual desktop users, or it could be supporting, you know, about 10 terabytes of a massively critical database. So cost per gigabyte or per terabyte is not kind of the right way to look at cost, it's what it's going to do for your business and the value you get out of it. In some ways it's like saying how much does a car cost, it depends what you need out of it and what the value of it is to you. But if you have any specific storage projects in mind, then we're happy to engage and go through a, a very simple and brief sizing exercise to see what it is you'd require and we can come back with some indicative costs. <clears throat> Thanks Max. Um, so a question here from Pete, um, does the array support Solar, uh, Solaris Spark hosts? Yep. Yes, it does. Yeah, the array, uh, the array supports all pretty much major OSs um, such as Windows, VMware, Solaris, AIX, HP UX. Um, you know, the only ones we don't support are the ones that you don't really see people using these days, such as Mainframe, True64, Irix. But we support all flavors of Linux. Um, yes, we support Solaris. Uh, we support Spark and x86. So yeah, not a problem. And we have, you know, some very very large customers using um, us with Solaris. Okay, so Pete's also um, asked, uh, do do Pure have an SMIS agent for integration with SCVMM? Uh, we don't today. The SMIS agent should be coming out in uh, September. So yeah, good question. So we don't have that today, but that will come. And then of course, once we've got SMIS, then we've got SCVMM, 
then we'll have integration with uh, you know a whole host of other tools. But we've got plugins for things like or integration with things like uh, Nagios, SolarWinds. We've got SNMP. We've got SNTP. Um, but yeah, SMIS is coming out in September. Great, thanks, Max. I have to wait a minute or two to see if there's any more questions. Okay, so I think that's, oh, um, someone's asked for a copy of the slides. Yep, I'll send um, those to you this afternoon along with the um, link to the webinar. Um, so it looks like that's all the questions for today. Um, so thanks so much, Max, for presenting, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, as mentioned previously, if you could please fill out uh, the feedback form at the end if you would like more information or a follow-up for a uh, call, sorry, um, that'd be great. Um, so once again, thanks, everyone, and thanks, Max, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.